this talk is about authenticated data structures and how they can be viewed as functors and how we've modeled them in Isabel Hall um, proof assistant. This is joint work with Onion Marriage. Uh, we both work at Digital Asset on the uh, open source smart contract language DAL and the corresponding synchronization protocol called Canton. What this is about is about distributed ledgers. And in our view, the main business value of distributed ledgers is that they provide a nice abstraction for multiple organizations, namely as a shared database. Now, unlike or, uh, ordinary shared databases, a distributed ledger allows that trust boundaries run through the database, right? So organization one could keep some of its data private, like internal calculations, um, offers and the like, and yet share uh, data with other organizations like mutual purchase agreements, contracts, and the like, and yet have their oper uh, applications operate seamlessly over those two data, uh, kinds of data. And in that view, a smart contract is essentially just defining the data schema, and the algorithms in the smart contract correspond to stored procedures in the database. Now, the implementation in practice looks, of course, differently. So the shared database is just an abstraction. Every organization keeps their own database. But there is a synchronization protocol um, that reaches across those trust boundaries. Now, what you use as synchronization protocol, um, originally, are uh, blockchains have been proposed and uh, promoted that way. But they come with a few drawbacks. For example, um, on a blockchain, normally everyone has to process everything, which puts a limit on scalability. There are confidentiality issues if you store data directly on the blockchain. And there are also concerns are about uh, removing data if it's uh, subject to regulatory uh, measures like GDPR or HIPAA. Or you could use something like Canton, um, the synchronization protocol that we're developing, um, which achieves the coordination between those databases without using a blockchain, but provides still the trust guarantees that you would expect. So how does this look like? Um, we'll look at a very simple example of a car deal. So suppose Alice wants to buy Bob's car. And I have a smart contract for car deals that I read on. And that contract would, could be written in DAML, the open source smart contract language that digital asset develops, um, essentially based on Haskell um, with an interpreter, the DAML runtime, that then translates the code into what is a hierarchical transaction? So, in the case for a smart contract D, um, we essentially have two legs. First leg, and uh, Alice instructs the bank to move the money to Bob. And in the second leg, Bob instructs the Department of Motor Vehicles to transfer the car title to Alice. And then there is, of course, the framing part, where which makes up actually the purchase agreement. Um, that ties the two legs together. Now, this is called a transaction because uh, we want the whole thing to execute atomically. That is, either both legs execute or none of them, such that neither of the two can end up with, without a car and without money, and so to reduce the counterparty risk. It's hierarchical in the sense that each leg could be a transaction on its own. And this hierarchical structure allows us uh, to compose work, complex workflows from simple building block. Moreover, the hierarchical transaction also tells us who needs to be involved in those parts. So for example, in the left leg, we only need to involve Bob, Alice, and the bank. Alice pays, Bob receives, and the bank does the transfer. And particularly, the Department of Motor Vehicles doesn't need to know that there is even such a left leg and what this leg is about. Vice versa, the bank doesn't need to know about the DMV uh, and that there is a car being transferred. 
um, that information is no business for the bank. And the big thing, of course, is only uh, part of uh, Alice and Bob, what, whatever they have agreed in their purchase agreement um, should only be visible to the two of them. Canton implements um, these visibility restrictions and the hierarchy of things by running a two-phase commit co protocol with a commit coordinator. Um, we don't need to go into details uh, how the protocol does that. A few more details are given in the paper, but see Canton.io for, oh, for the rest of uh, the thing. Um, what is important is that a commit coordinator doesn't need to see the whole transaction. It only needs to see sufficient metadata, like visibility information, in order to know, uh, in order to be able to run the protocol. But the decision whether the transaction should execute or not is actually with the different um, stakeholders. And in order to implement these visibility restrictions and yet the ability to uh, not having to trust any of those uh, completely, we use authenticated data structures. Now, what is an authenticated data structure? Um, essentially, it's data arranged in a tree, um, like a count and transaction tree. But that tree comes with a concept of a digest, which is a short reference to uh, the tree as a whole. You, don't, you can refer to a tree without knowing all its contents. And then there is inclusion proofs, or Merkle proofs, which um, essentially establish that a certain piece of data is contained in that tree referenced by digest at a given position in the tree. And that's a very general concept. The best known example are Merkle trees, but we'll see in a minute. And what we've done is we've come up with a shallow embedding of authenticated data structures into higher order logic, specifying an abstract interface of operations um, and the properties. And that defines the class of Merkle functors that we've introduced, which is closed and fixed points and uh, composition, and therefore leads to modular construction of those authenticated data structures. And then to, to prove that this is actually usable, we actually use it to formalize a real world protocol. There's one caveat. Um, this is all about symbolic cryptography. So we're assuming that uh, cryptographic primitives are uh, perfect. In particular, there are no hash collisions. So rather than going for the complex example of Canton transaction trees, let's look at a well-known example, binary trees, which will turn into Merkle trees. So binary tree with labels at the leaf. I'm using Isabel syntax here and all variables starting with prime A, prime are type variables, and they come before the type constructor. So type constructors are written post fix. And those fancy curly uh, angle brackets are just the limiting um, things. So here we have a plain binary tree, such as this one. This is the data structure that we want. We want to turn this into a uh, authenticated data structure, so we need a digest. And the digest is actually a hash tree. So we assume that on the atoms that stored at the leaves, we already have a hash function that we can employ. And then we can essentially pull up and for each inner node compute using possibly a different hash function, uh, a hash of the combination of the hashes of the two children. And we can lift that up. And once we re reach the root, um, this is what will be our unambiguous reference to the data structure. And of course, if the hash function is one way and the data is sufficiently uh, high entropy, then the digest doesn't leak any information about the tree as such. Now for inclusion proofs, um, suppose we want to prove that the data structure referred to by a digest contains the number two, and this is what we would hand out. So we look at the path from the root to that position, and every sibling of a node on that path is replaced by its corresponding hash. Now this is really an inclusion proof because in order to check that this refers, uh, that this to is really part of the data structure, we can just do the recomputation of the hashes as we've done with the hash tree and check that we end up with the same digest. Now this is an inclusion proof for a single position, but in theory we could 
also have multiple position, and that's actually what we're also using in Tamsin. Um, and then we would just have more leaves unblinded rather than being hash. Now, what this talk will explain is how we can actually find the type of digest as a data type, and those hash trees will be suffix, uh, sub, suffix by subscript h, and how we can build those inclusion proofs, and they will carry a subscript m, and how we can systematically define those op uh, the operations and the theorems. The operations that we'll look at is essentially a hash function. Our focus will be on inclusion proofs because they're the richest data structure here. A hash function from the inclusion proofs to the hash tree. So from the type of inclusion proofs to the type of hash trees. And then a the merge operation in, on inclusion proofs, um, which will be our main workhorse. So the merge operation is partial because inclusion proofs may have different uh, digests and therefore it doesn't make sense to merge those but if they have the same hash then we can merge to inclusion proofs a and b and that gives us some inclusion proof a b and then merging itself is idempotent commutative and associative so we have a semi lattice structure here and of course merges then the join operation in that semi lattice, we also get an induced order uh, and we get nice algebraic properties that we can use to reason about these things. Now, how do we deal, uh, do with these uh, operations? Well, we essentially borrow the ideas from functors. For those who are not familiar with functors or for everyone else, let's have a quick reminder what functors are about. Well, they take a set of atoms, like one, two, three, and the functor f then builds complicated values like binary trees over those atoms. And of course, there are more trees than I've just shown to. Now, you don't do that only with a single uh, set of atoms, but you can do that with any set of atoms. You can also have hash and dollar, and then we build binary trees over those. And what's the interesting part about functors is that they can lift things. So if we have a function um, on the atoms, mapping one to hash, two, three to dollar, then that lifts to a function over those complicated values using the mapper f. And that has to satisfy a set of properties, functorial structure, right? Now for our um, Merkle functors, and our authenticated data structures, we not only have a single functor, but we have several. One functor to construct binary trees, and now we want to get a functor that constructs the digests, right? So we want to do the same lifting again. If we have a digest function on the atoms, we want to get a digest function on the full tree. And here comes the big caveat. We can assume, we assume that the digest function is injective because this is the hash function and we assume hash collisions don't occur. Since this is injective, we can consider the data to be embedded in the digests. And therefore, accordingly, the values constructed over those atoms being also sorts of digests. Because logically, we could always go back using um, choice, the axiom of choice. Right. But in practice, you can't really tell whether a digest corresponds to some real data or whether it just is a random byte string and contains garbage. And therefore, our digests are not only the data, but enriched with garbage. And accordingly, um, the hash trays also may contain garbage, either to leave or somewhere in there. And then we can do the same thing for inclusion proofs. The inclusion proof functor will be a bifunctor because inclusion proofs contain both hashes for the blinded parts and sub-inclusion proofs for the unblinded parts. And then our Merkle interface had this hash operation that computes the uh, digest. And we want to lift that, merge, uh, that hash function like a functor does. And the same thing for merge. Merging on the atoms is merging on the complicated values. In a way, such that we can prove such preservation theorems, if hash and merge on the atoms satisfy the interface, then 
so do the lifted operations. And that gives us the modular construction that I mentioned. To see that with the binary trees, um, we started with this data type definition, but let's look at an isomorphic version where we just have a single constructor. The different constructors becomes, uh, the choice becomes a, a sum, and the node constructor is uncarried into a product. Now, this binary tree doesn't contain any information about where authentication should happen. So what we do is we add, we add a marker. So blindable is an identity constructor here with a marker that marks where that marks the position where the inclusion proof can actually prove inclusion. And from once we have that, every, the rest is fully systematic, right? So what will happen is that the hash version just replaces all the type constructors that appear in the definition with the hash version, with the H version. And similarly, the inclusion proof type constructor with subscript M, in the same way, systematically replaces everything with subscript M. And of course, here we have another copy with the H, which is you have the two atoms coming in. And this not only applies to the data type definitions, it also applies to the uh, hash operations. So if we want to define a hash function for the uh, binary tree, uh, parameterized by hash function on the atoms, then what we'll see is that, well, the sum type, every type constructor here, translates directly into a uh, corresponding operation and the composition that we see up here of types corresponds to function application down here. And the data type definition with the recursion translates into a recursive function definition down here. And for merge, it is essentially the same. And the proof of the preservation theorem is again, very compositional following this very structure. In order to do that, we need a few building blocks. So if we look at what we have here, we have sums, we have products, we've got blindable, and we've got recursion. And we've developed a theory for all of that. The details are in the paper. But and yet what we get is a theorem that would prove that Merkle functors, and a Merkle functor is a functor with, that satisfies a generalization of the interface that I've shown you, they're closed in the composition at least fixed point. That means, and it contains, planable summit product. That means whatever you can do, um, whatever you can build from planable sum products and data types built from those is a Merkle factor and you get a construction for free. For Canton, the transaction tree that you see on the left, well, every gray box corresponds to a view, which we formalized here on the right, which contains some metadata and some actual data, both are blindable, and then a list of uh, subviews. So it doesn't need to be a binary tree, we have an arbitrary branching tree. And that is one data structure, and then there's more transaction metadata packed around the list of views which then gives us a uh, transaction structure. So this is how we formalize Canton transaction trees. Now, if we do the modular construction for those, we end up with two fixed points. One is obvious, the data type view does recursion here. The other is hidden because there's the list data type through which the recursion goes. And that's yet another data type and that shows the compositionality of the approach. And then, other than that, there's just 12 compositions that we need to apply. And essentially the proofs are copy paste uh, and they could be easily automated in Isabel. But it gives us a very, very systematic way to handle such complicated data structures in a very systematic fashion. And we'll get the right properties that we want. Now I've talked a lot about uh, how to create inclusion proofs, uh, how to reason about inclusion proofs, but we also need to create those. Um, and there's actually a fairly nice idea that also shows the power of our interface. So suppose we want to uh, prove inclusion of this subtree. So we want to 
you get the included proof shown at the bottom. And how did, can we systematically arrive there? Well, there's something in functional programming called a zipper, which allows you to focus at a particular position in a tree. And Sean Seafried, three years ago, um, already uh, mentioned that for Merkle trees. So we can focus on this subtree, uh, putting, looking at the path to this uh, subtree and putting the context into uh, these one whole context. Now these one whole contexts are easy to blind because we need to blind everything except the whole. So that's easy to do. So we get a blinded zipper and all we need to do is now reassemble the thing such that we get an inclusion proof. And that's an inclusion proof for a one whole context. Or, well, no, it's an inclusion proof for a single position because zippers are one whole context. But if you need multiple positions, you can just merge them and then you get the uh, Get a theorem so far. Why? That is one example of the power of merge. To summarize, we've found a way to view authenticated data structures as functors. We formalized everything in a little hole. The meta theory and the application are towards Damo and Canton. If you want to have a look at the formalization, it's available in the archive of formal proofs. The rules given there. Um, if you want to find more about Damo, or counting. Please visit the website. In the future, on ADS, we would actually like to get rid of this assumption about injectivity of the hash function, um, basically by actually modeling hash collisions in our work. We've got a few ideas how that could work, but haven't uh, finished that yet. And that will also be, um, well, one step further towards being able to reason about confidentiality. So the modeling that we've chosen works nicely for authentication properties. And that's enough for proving the integrity theorem for counting. But to reason about confidentiality, we need more elaborate calculus. Um, but we also have some ideas about that. Thank you.